Okay, good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to the uh, meeting of uh, St. John Common Council for April the 2nd. Uh, first order of item, uh, Common Clerk, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor. First item is the land acknowledgement. Okay, over to you, Councillor Sullivan. Thank you, Deputy. The land on which the city of St. John, or Menaquist, is situated is the traditional territory of the Wollastuik. The Wollastuik, along with their indigenous neighbors, the Mi'kmaq and the Peskatomakati, signed peace and friendship treaties with the British Crown in the 1700s that protected their rights to lands and resources. Let's take a moment to pause and reflect. Okay, thank you, Councillor. Next item, Common Clerk. Uh, next is the National Anthem. Uh, next on the agenda is item 2.1, approval of the March 18th Council Minutes. I get a motion to approve the minutes. Councillor Radwan and Councillor Stewart on the motion. All those in favor? Against, if any? Motion's carried. Next item, Council Clerk. Uh, next is the approval of the agenda, item 3. And uh, the first item we're asking on this is to remove item 5.1 from the agenda as it was duplicated with item 5.4. And then there are four additions to this agenda from Committee of the Whole. So the first one would be 17.1, that's for the sale of lands in Douglas Avenue to PNB. 17.2, city market lease with Chicken by Felix. 17.3, incorporation of St. John Industrial Parks, and 17.4, release of easement and restrictive covenants against PID 55008932. Okay, can I get a motion then please to uh, accept the agenda as amended? Councillor Sullivan and Councillor Radwan, all in favor? Opposed if any, motion's carry. Thank you, next item, Common Clerk. Uh, next is disclosures of conflict of interest, if we have any. Okay, I don't see any. Uh, next item, Council Clerk. Uh, next is the consent agenda. Okay, over to you, Councillor Sullivan. Thanks, Deputy. Uh, as I understand it, I'll move the consent agenda, which is 5.2 through 5.11 inclusive. Okay, can I get a seconder, please? Councillor Ogden on the question. All of the paper signify by saying aye. Opposed, if any. Motion's carried. Next item, Common Clerk. Thank you, Deputy. Next on the agenda is item six, members' comments. Okay, members' comments. Uh, 
Councillor Hickey, to start us off. Uh, thanks, Your Worship. I uh, just wanted to recognize uh, Maestro Fresh West, who's a big, uh, big Juno appearance and uh, awards in the Junos uh, the other week in Halifax. Congratulations to St. John's very own. Yes, absolutely. Good point. Uh, he certainly uh, put us on the map again. Uh, Councillor Radwan, you next. Thank you, Deputy. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to mention, of course, uh, as the weather's starting to get nice, people are starting to get out, and a lot of community groups will be starting to do some cleanup. So just keep in mind that the city does have the green machine that can be uh, booked on our website, and we also have a, a party block trailer as well that can be booked on the website. Um, this whole slew of birthdays have been going on in my family, so just wanted to say happy belated birthday to my mom and my father-in-law, and uh, a very happy birthday to Bertha Roby Show. That's my aunt. She's turning 90. She's a Laurenville resident, very proud, very active member of the community center over there, so happy 90th birthday. Excellent. Well, happy birthday. And Councilor Sullivan, over to you. Thanks, Deputy. A uh, little bit of early advertising. I had a conversation with a member of Stella Maris Church this past week, and, and as much as auctions have gone online, they are having an in-person auction at the Hope Center on Star Wars Day. So May the 4th, uh, when you're looking to celebrate Star Wars, meet some people and support a great cause. They're raising money to support uh, another family of newcomers to come to St. John. So a great cause by a great group of people over at Stella Maris, the Hope Center on May the 4th. Thanks. Excellent, excellent. Well, we have another birthday to recognize. So yesterday was the 100th anniversary of the Royal Canadian Air Force here in Canada. And, uh, you know, uh, we have two uh, RCAF squadrons that are have freedom of the city with uh, City St. John. And that's uh, 403 and 410 squadrons. And I'll be going to Fredericton this week for a presentation of a banner, which we will be delivering to the mayor of Calgary uh, in June uh, for uh, 410 squadron. 403 is Gagetown, 410 is uh, out in Alberta. Also, uh, there's a couple of big celebrations uh, last week. I uh, we went to the Iftar dinner at the Exhibition Park and uh, the Persian New Year, the Norwoods at uh, Renforth Golf and Country Club. Um, both uh, of those gatherings were extremely exciting and, uh, you know, it's nice to welcome a new year. Uh, also, we had a huge, huge uh, announcement uh, last week on the 25th, $108 million for the uh, New Brunswick Museum. So New Brunswick's back on the map. We're going to have a new museum and uh, a place to put all of our history. And that's very exciting. Okay, so next item, Common Clerk. Uh, thank you. Next on the agenda is a proclamation, item 7.1, and it's for National Public Safety Telecommunications Week. Okay, whereas emergencies can occur at any time requiring police, fire, or emergency medical services, and whereas an emergency occurs, the prompt, re the prompt response of police officers, firefighters, and paramedics is critical to the protection of life and preservation of property, and whereas the safety of our police officers, firefighters, and paramedics is dependent upon the quality and accuracy of information obtained from citizens contacting the Public Safety Communications Center, and whereas the Public Safety Communications Center is the first link to citizens seeking emergency services, and whereas every year during the second week of April, the telecommunications personnel and the public safety community are honored nationally and whereas April the 14th to April 20th, 2024, is recognized as National Public Safety Telecommunications Week, and whereas National Public Safety Telecommunications Week is a time to celebrate and thank the Public Safety Communications Center operators for their compassion, understanding, and professionalism in their performance of the duty serving the public. Now, therefore, I, John McKenzie, Deputy Mayor of the City of St. John, do hereby proclaim the week of April 14th, April 20th, as National Public Safety Telecommunications Week in honor of those whose diligence and professionals keep our city and citizens safe. Thank you. Next item, Common Clerk. 
Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, just wanted to clarify, I had a, a note from the CAO, and just to ensure that uh, the correct numbers were read out on the consent agenda. So what, was, what we had asked to remove was item 5.3. So um, can we confirm that the vote was on items 5, 1, 5, 2, 5, 4, 5, 5, 5, 8, 5, 7, 5, 8, 5, 9, 5, 10. So it was 5, 3 that was yeah. removed? It was 5, 3. And we Councilor thought we Sullivan heard that, that Councillor Sullivan said item 5, um, 5, 2 to 5, 11. So we just want to make sure that it's clear for the record. Okay. So, so maybe just take the vote again. Okay, on. so on that, uh, can we have a uh, mover and a seconder and we'll revote? Councillor Harris? Okay, and Councillor uh, Bradwan on the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion's carried. Thank you. Okay, that's good. Uh, so it's not quite 6.30 yet, and that's the time for our public hearing. So we could skip over now to some of the uh, bylaws. Uh, the first one on, under the bylaws that requires approval is 10.1. And this is for a traffic bylaw amendment, residential parking permit fee increase. And this is third reading. Okay. So we'll go to Mike. Uh, so Commissioner uh, Hugen holds a Hugen Hugen brief uh, introduction. Uh, good evening, mem uh, Your Worship, members of council. Uh, before you this evening is a third reading, third and final reading for an amendment to the bylaw for the residential parking permit fees. This would have been considered on March 18th for first and second reading. It's just a minor change to adjust the value of the permit um, for uh, to the tune of $15 a year. Uh, with that, I'll turn it back over to the chair, subject to your questions. Thank you, Commissioner. Over to you, Donald Clerk, for the reading. Thank you. Uh, so for this item, we require two motions, uh, third reading in its entirety, and then third reading by title. Okay, can I get a motion for third reading in its entirety, please? Councillor Stewart and Councillor Radwan. All those in favor? Opposed, if any? Motion is carried. A bylaw to, am a bylaw to amend a bylaw. Uh, with respect to the traffic on streets in the city of St. John and amendments there too. Okay. A bylaw of the city of St. John entitled a bylaw respecting traffic on streets in the city of St. John bylaw MV 10 and amendments there too enacted on the seventh day of October 2019 is amended by number one. Subsection 24.6 is repealed and replaced with the following. 24.6, the annual fee for residential zone parking <coughs> permit shall be $75, including applicable tax. And now another motion, uh, Deputy, to approve this by title. Can I get a motion to approve by title, please? Councillor Sullivan, Councillor Stewart, on the motion. All those in favor? Opposed, if any? Motion is carried. Next item, please. Uh, next is item 10.2. Uh, this is a traffic bylaw amendment, Topeka Street commercial vehicle and trailer parking. Again, this one's for third reading. Okay, we'll send that over to Commissioner Huckenholt. Good evening again. And uh, again, this is the third and final reading for a traffic bylaw amendment uh, to deal with uh, an ongoing issue of commercial vehicle parking on Topeka Street and the immediate environment. Uh, we did Council did uh, give first and second reading again on March 18th. So um, subject to your questions, I'll turn it over to you for the required readings. Okay. Any questions? Over to you, Comment Clerk. Uh, thank you. So this is the same as the previous one. It requires two motions, approval of third reading in its entirety, and then approval of third reading by title. Okay. Can I get a motion for third reading in its entirety? Councillor Lowe. Seconded by Councilor Radwan. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Opposed, if any. Motions carried. A bylaw to amend a bylaw respecting the traffic on streets in the city of St. John. A bylaw of the city of St. John entitled Bylaw Respecting the Traffic on Streets in the City of St. John, bylaw number MV 10.1, and amendments thereto, enacted on the seventh day of October 2019, is amended by is amended as follows. One, the following subsection is added immediately after 5.7, 5.8. No person shall stop, stand, or park a commercial vehicle, trailer, or pole trailer in a parking zone designated in Schedule R to this bylaw at any time unless the commercial vehicle, trailer, or pole trailer 
is there for not more than 30 minutes and merchandise is either loaded into it or unloaded from it. Number two, Schedule R, 30-minute commercial vehicle parking is added with the following words under the following headings. Street, Topeka, side both, limit, Graham Street to Courtney Avenue. Street, Graham Street, side both, limit, Jean Street to Wilton Street. And Street, Courtney Avenue, side north, limit, Wilton Street to Jean Street. And now another motion, Deputy, to approve this by title. Title. Okay. Can I get a motion to approve by title, please? Councillor Ogden, Councillor Hickey, on the motion. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion's carried. Next item. And next is another bylaw. Um, this one's for 10.3, St. John's Skateboard Bylaw Amendment, third reading. Okay. Over to you, Commissioner Iguanol. Keeping your uh, yes, uh, Councillor will recall a submission from a community member uh, sometime last year uh, with a request to make the skateboard park an all wheels park and that is uh, essentially permitting scooters and other wheel devices in there as well. Uh, we are supportive and uh, to enact that to make that a reality, uh, we did need to make an amendment to our skateboard bylaw. Uh, so again, first and second reading would have been considered on the March 18th meeting of council. Uh, before you this evening is the third reading. So subject to your questions, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you. Okay, over to you, Councillor. Thank you. And for this bylaw, we require uh, approval of third reading in entirety and then approval of third reading by title. Okay, can I get a motion to read? Uh, Councillor Stewart and Councillor Hickey on the motion. All in favor? Opposed, if any, motions carried. A bylaw to amend a bylaw respecting the use of skateboards and other recreational equipments within the City of St. John, bylaw number M27. A bylaw of the City of St. John entitled a bylaw respecting the use of skateboards and other recreational equipments within the City of St. John, bylaw M27, enacted on the 26th day of August 2013, is hereby amended as follows. One, the definition of Station one skate park in paragraph two is repealed and replaced with station one all wheels park. Means the all wheels park located at TD station site bounded by Station Street in the city. Two, subsection five two is repealed and replaced with the following. Skateboards are only permitted in station one all wheels parks. Section three, subsection five three is amended by deleting the following words but for certainty, it's not permitted in Station 1 Skate Park. Number four, Schedule A is repealed and replaced with the following. One, Station 1 All Wheels Park. Two, Harbor Passage. Three, Rockwood Park, including all sidewalks and paved pathways within the park. And four, the designated area within Marketplace West forming part of parcel identifier 00361675. And now a motion to approve by title. Okay. I get a motion to approve by title. Councillor Radwan, Councillor Hickey. On the motion, all in favor? Any opposed? Motion's carried. A bylaw to amend a bylaw respecting the use of skateboards and other recreational equipments within the City of St. John, bylaw number M27. Okay, next item, comment. Next is 10.4, and this is for a building bylaw amendment. Over to you, Commissioner Pothenroth. Thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, to en enhance flexibility and ensure continuous duty coverage, staff is proposing an amendment to the building bylaw to authorize the appointment of one or more deputy building inspectors. This adjustment aims to streamline operations, provide comprehensive coverage, and enhance customer service by enabling more than one staff member to fulfill the duties of deputy building inspector as required. If council approves the proposed amendment to the bylaw, staff will bring a resolution forward at a subsequent meeting to formally authorize any additional staff member as a deputy in accordance with standard procedure. And I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, not seeing any questions, Common Clerk. Thank you. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Thank you. Um, I guess, um, Commissioner Poffinroth, can you, uh, I know that we're, you know, we're experiencing a lot of, um, a lot of construction right now, and I know we've, we've had some turnover in our staff, or in our staffing around permit, permitting and, and uh, inspectors and things like that. 
Um, is there currently any delays that we're facing? And if so, what are we expecting this to, what level of service are we expecting this to increase or improve things by for, say, permitting and inspection specifically? Certainly, Th through your worship to Councillor Harris. Um, with respect to the building permit and inspection area, we've had pretty quite a bit of stability in our staffing recently. This allows, given I will maintain the um, the designation as chief building inspector, this allows for there to be one or more deputies, um, as I will be, you know, busy doing other commissioner type of roles and uh, responsibilities. So this just offers more flexibility. Um, the deputy building inspector provides advice, guidance, and support to developers and our building inspection team. So the opportunity to have one or more just allows us to essentially deal with more files at the same time at that level. Okay. And so we're still meeting our targets currently for permitting turnaround times and things like that and inspections or... Turnaround times we are meeting. I think there's still improvement there, and, and it really depends on the time of year the, okay. and the number of applications. But we're we're still doing well in that. But I always think there's more improvement that that we can make there. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, over here, Tom. Thank you. Uh, this requires approval of uh, first and second reading by title. Okay, can I get a motion to first and second, Councillor Sullivan? Seconded by Councilor Radwan. All in favor? Opposed, if any. Motion's carried. And this is titled a bylaw to amend a bylaw respecting the construction, repair, and demolition of buildings in the City of St. John made under the authority of the Building Code Administration Act and amendments thereto. And now another approval by title. Okay, can I get a second motion? Councilor Sullivan. Councilor Sullivan, Councilor Stewart on the motion. All in favor? Opposed, if any? Motion's carried. A bylaw to amend a bylaw respecting the construction, repair, and demolition of buildings in the City of St. John made under the authority of the Building Code Administration Act and amendments thereto. Okay, thank you. Next item, Common Clerk. And uh, the final item under bylaws is 10.5. And uh, this is a proposed municipal plan amendment for 901 Foster Thurston Drive. And in your packet, you'll see a letter from me. And it's what we call our 30-day letter. And just notifying council that a public presentation on this item was made on February 20th for this particular amendment at 901 Foster Thurston Drive. And uh, the time period has now elapsed. Uh, we have done the required advertisement for this property and attached you'll find all the documentation associated with it. And so at this stage, council may now choose to refer this matter to the Planning Advisory Committee for a report and recommendation and authorize the necessary advertising for a public hearing to be held in this council chamber on Monday, June the 10th. Okay, thank you. Can I get a motion to... Uh Approve uh, to go to PAC, Councillor Ogden, Councillor Hickey on the motion. All in favor? Any uh, against? Motion's carried. Next item, Madam Clerk. Uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor. And it's now uh, 6.30, so we can go back to our public hearing. Okay, perfect. And so uh, for that item, uh, there's just one public hearing tonight. And uh, it's item 9.1 on your agenda. And it's for a proposed zoning bylaw amendment with a planning advisory committee report and staff presentation for the property at 430 to 4 to sorry, 730 to 740 Foster Thurston Drive. Okay, thank you. We have a staff presentation. Commissioner Pathanath. Thank you. Good evening, Deputy and members of Council. Before you this evening for a public hearing is an application for an amendment to the zoning bylaw for the property at 730 to 740 Foster Thurston Drive, the YMCA's Glen Carpenter Center. The application has been evaluated by staff and the Planning Advisory Committee and included in your package is a recommendation to approve the rezoning. This amendment will facilitate construction of an outdoor education center which will provide after school programming and recognize the existing use of the site. And with that, I'll now turn it over to Mark Reed, 
the senior planner for the staff presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Uh, your worship and counsel, um, as Amy mentioned, this application is a rezoning and the applicant is proposing to construct a new building for a after school child care center. And also the rezoning would accommodate the existing and proposed uses of the site. Um, the proposed site here, it's shown in the, uh, the central portion of the uh, map. Uh, we're rezoning the entirety of their uh, four parcels on Foster Thurston Drive. Uh, there's a zoom in here showing where the um, building is located. It would be located to the east of Ashburn Lake along the existing internal access road. Uh, we have a floor plan as well. Uh, essentially, it would be three classrooms with the uh, required support space uh, for the after school uh, classes. Uh, cross sections of the building, it's a one story building with a pitched roof. Uh, as well, there's a veranda on the front portion of the building as well. Uh, the building uh, blends in well with the existing rural character of the site. Uh, the site itself, it, there's four parcels uh, along the north side of Foster Thurston Drive uh, in around Ashburn Lake. Uh, we have a view here along the internal site access road. Uh, the area for development is just off to the left of the photo. Uh, this is an area here, there has been some clearing that has taken place uh, prior to the application uh, with respect to the required uh, geotechnical work on site. Uh, the developer has secured all of the necessary uh, provincial wetland and water course alteration permits for the exploratory work as well as the proposed building. Uh, this is another site here showing the cleared area and access into uh, the development site from the internal access road. Uh, the municipal plan has the site largely designated as rural resource with areas along the lake and water courses designated as park and natural area. Uh, the rural resource policy has the lands uh, to remain in their natural state or appropriate resource uses. Uh, staff are of the opinion that um, the plan is met given it's a primarily a summer camp property uh, located in a uh, forested wooded area of the city. Uh, there are areas, park and natural area, uh, as I mentioned before, related to water courses and wetlands, and the applicant has obtained the required uh, provincial permitting for work with, around these water courses. Um, again, it's an existing long-standing community use in a forested setting, and it conforms to the municipal plan and the recently released provincial statements of public interest. Uh, zoning of the site, it's currently zoned rural. Uh, we're rezoning from rural to major community facility, allows for the permitted uses of a community center, daycare center, and recreation facility. Staff are recommending approval without any uh, proposed Section 59 conditions. In terms of community engagement, uh, staff issued letters to landowners within 100 meters of the site on March the 4th, and uh, notice of tonight's public hearing was posted on our website on March 11th. Uh, the PAC meeting, uh, staff have not received any letters regarding the application. Uh, we had two area landowners uh, who appeared before the committee. Uh, both were in support of the application with one uh, having some questions around uh, the proposed uses. Uh, staff's recommendation is to rezone the site to major community facility. Uh, there was also a temporary use approved by PAC uh, that provides for staff to uh, sign off on the required permits. Uh, in the interim period between the PAC meeting and final approval of the rezoning. Uh, that work would be undertaken at the applicant's risk and should the rezoning not be approved, they would have to do any required site remediation. Uh, the committee's adoption, the committee essentially adopted staff recommendation to um, rezone the site to major community facility. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Okay, I'm going to uh, call the public hearing to order. And uh, I will ask for anyone who wants to speak against this proposal to step forward, please. Anyone want to speak against for the second time? And third and final time, anyone want to speak against? Okay, does anybody want to speak in favor of the proposal? I'll get you to step up and state your name for the record. Thank you, uh, Your Worship, Council and Staff. Uh, Shiloh Boucher, 
President and CEO of the YMCA of Southwestern New Brunswick. And I wanted to just highlight, obviously I'm in support of the project because you know I work at the Y uh, and this project's really important to us. And they told me I'm just gonna have to click something to make it happen here. Oh, he's gonna come help me. Uh, I just really wanted to highlight the impact of expanding the Glen Carpenter Center and what that means to our fine city. Um, turning this facility into a 10 week um, program area into 52 weeks, I think is gonna have a tremendous impact on our city and uh, in our region. And just thinking about the YMCA in general, we, we last year we served 44,000 people and in this facility being expanded, uh, we're expecting to serve an additional 5,000 people. So we're very excited to really expand our reach, not only in childcare, uh, but also in terms of, of recreation um, and all that we can offer to all families in the community. And so this is creating, and so there's a picture of what the facility will look like. Um, so as mentioned by staff, which we're in full support of staff's recommendations, um, fits very nicely into the area and is fully accessible building because we are creating a net new 90 spaces uh, for after school, which there's a huge uh, wait list for in our facilities for an after school for after school program. And it will also allow us to expand childcare, which is another uh, huge need in our in our community. And uh, the Y is dedicated to help fill that fill that need. So we're excited uh, to have the support of um, of the city and the staff, and um, just hope that you're as excited about the project as we are, uh, and what we can make happen together. Because we do expect that this facility will be open to community members. There'll be more activities <coughs> happening out there, and we're also we started opening it to our members last summer, and I know they're excited as well uh, to come use the facility. So it's going to be a full full service facility. Thank you. Thank you. We have one. We have a couple of questions for you, Shiloh. Okay. Uh, Councillor Ogden. Yeah, I just want to say I'm. Uh, is it on? Yeah, yeah. I just want to say that I'm full support of this. I went to the announcement last spring when they sprung this on us, and uh, <laughs> and it's great. Um, I'm a big, big um, believer at that uh, recreation is great for mental and physical health. It lowers our health care costs. It's great for learning. The brain needs physical activity to learn and what they're doing this. And in 52 weeks a year, where we're always complaining about kids being inside and, and weathermen telling us it's a bad day, we shouldn't go outside because it's snowing. This just reverses that whole psychology. And uh, I just, this is just great. Um, by the way, it once the property once belonged to C.N. Wilson, who built the largest dry dock in the world. It's still here today. And uh, then it was passed to, uh, or purchased by Glenn Carpenter. But I think it's just a fabulous idea and really, really encourage everyone to support it. Thank you. Councillor Councilor Radwan. Thank you, Deputy. Uh, hi, Shiloh. Thanks for coming. Um, I really, I just really had a question about the use. So, I mean, it does talk about the after hours program, so incredibly important as you very well know. Um, but I'm wondering if there's any, gonna be any use for it in the daytime or in the evenings. And when I think of myself as somebody who worked for Horizon for over nine years, and now so many city staff have long shifts, 10 hour shifts, 12 hour shifts, 48 hour shifts. I'm wondering if there's any opportunities for childcare to be able to accommodate their kind of needs with this facility. I hope so. <laughs> we are planning to fill this facility uh, all all day long because, as we know, childcare mm -hmm. operates from about two to six. I know the school district just made some changes there. Uh, so our our goal is to have uh, whether it's school groups, families, members, uh, different uh, groups. I was talking to Ryzen um, today about what can we provide out of this facility, and so it's a very much a multi-purpose facility. So that yes, after school is licensed, and we have to have it, we have to have it operating. But we're, we built it in a way where that that fun equipment gets to go away, and and other fun equipment can come out, um, because that's how we build things at the Y. We make sure they're very multi-purpose, so that we can serve the need of the community and keep changing as our community needs change as well and that's why we're getting great support we're getting we're fundraising for this project right now thank you for mentioning glenn carpenter who donated the pro the the property to us 20 years ago so it's about time we figured out how to make this happen we're a little <laughs> slow on this one um but uh, yeah we're real really happy to be um getting the community support around this project that we are 
That's great to hear because there always seemed to be a gap in like this huge demand because it was those people that worked 12 hour shifts, four on, five off at the hospital, that if they didn't have a family member to look after their kids, they couldn't continue working. So it's great if there's things available to them and to staff like staff at the city of St. John. So that's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Shiloh. Def definitely going to fill a need. Absolutely. 90 spaces. We need them desperately. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'll ask one more time. Is there anybody wanting to speak in favor? Hi. Um, <clears throat> pardon me, I got a bit of a cold. My name's Tim Jones. I'm a, a neighbor to, uh, to the YMCA right across the street. Um, we built uh, in 2018 Tiernanook Forest School, and just a little clarity on that. <clears throat> we don't operate in a not-for-profit environment. We operate for profit, and with the mandate of the provincial government and federal government in 2022, we were forced into a position where we could no longer offer those programs to our children. And um, so we are ecstatic um, that somebody is picking up that stick and running with it. Um, and there's no better identity or organization than the YMCA operating not-for-profit and making this available um, to the children of the community and not just those that can afford it, but those that uh, need it the most. Um, Mr. Ogden, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't agree with you more. Outdoor education, there's certainly a gap there. Um, when we started this journey over 10 years ago, we really opened the eyes to outdoor education in the province, and we love to see those picking up and run with it. We've met with Shiloh and her team on a few occasions in the past and certainly promoted and encouraged them to move forward with this. The other thing that I just want to mention as well, um, uh, I found it very refreshing um, going through this experience on my zoning and building the land, uh, the, the lodge and the land. We, we invested a couple million dollars there. Um, uh, I found this very refreshing on the approach from city staff when it came to looking at this application. Um, within our current zone, we're very limited. Our, our hands are tied today in relation to what we can do out of that facility just because we were restricted to, with conditions on conditions section 59. Um, the approach on this project is phenomenal. And from somebody who's investing into the city, from somebody who meets with developers every day and has a coffee and we talk about it, we talk about their projects, I couldn't be more encouraged that we're not bringing these projects down with all of the, you know, uh, unnecessarily uh, engineering reports that maybe are a little bit above and beyond. We recognize some projects require that, but we also encourage that money to go towards a better cause of serving the children versus being run down in traffic impact and a few other pro um, projects. I think we have the expertise in staff, and I think that we utilize that in this prime example in this uh, in this project. And I couldn't um, I couldn't welcome that more. Um, I also had the opportunity, and I'll finish up here real, real quick, uh, to meet with with Mr. McGovern and um, Mr. Dalbestein and also Mr. McKenzie about uh, about that approach to development. And we're really encouraged um, with that with that uh, that way forward. Uh, I know we are have taken our time over the last year and a half, uh, two years almost to look at our approach for our um, building and our, our, uh, our investment across the street and have approached the city and, and have been very encouraged with the conversations we've had so far on being able to move some of those projects forward. So Shiloh, great job. Um, I met with Shiloh, I had a lot of questions at PAC, but I thought that was the place for it versus here. Um, but great job. I by chance ran into Shiloh the day after PAC um, and had the opportunity to speak with her for about 10 minutes and offered her our building offered in any way our, our land that we could support. I, I recognize they're not going to be ready for September, and if we can support that transition in any way possible, we offered that to uh, to Shiloh and the team. So, um, great job to the city, um, great job to council, and great job to PAC for moving this forward. And Shiloh, thank you. Thank you, Tim. Sound like a good neighbor. <laughs> okay, uh, and I'm just is there anybody else willing to speak for? No, that must be three times. Okay. Thank you, Common Clerk. And next would be if there are any questions for staff once you close the public hearing. Okay, so I'm going to close the public hearing then. And do we have any questions for staff on this particular proposal? Not seeing any. Okay. Over to you, Common Clerk. Uh, this one requires just a um, First and second reading by title only, so just the two motions. Okay, can I get a motion to for the by title and it'd be 
Councilor Radwan and Councilor Hickey on the motion. All those in favor? Opposed, if any? Motion's carried. A law to amend the zoning bylaw of the City of St. John. Next. And just one more motion on that same Okay, reading. can I get a motion for the to read you, second reading of title? Okay, Councilor Stewart and Councilor Sullivan. All those in favor? Any opposed? Motion's carried. Thank you very much. A law to amend the zoning bylaw of the City of St. John. Okay, next item, Common Clerk. And next uh, is under business matters. It would be item 12.1. An update from the CAO on select catalytic projects and advocacy. Okay, over to you, CAO. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, for the catalytic projects update, I'll provide an update on uh, three of the infrastructure projects and one of the advocacy projects of the um, gathering space or the Idoli Makahamak uh, since the Update in March, the contractor has nearly completed the installation of the retaining walls for the tidal steps and the underground piping for the rock pool fountain is now complete as well. And the next step is to form the landscaped islands that will outline the rock pool fountain and uh, the harbour passage areas. So, uh, demolition of the promenade area between Market Slip and Market Square has started and uh, Harbour Passage will continue along this area. Uh, the stage building is progressing well uh, with siding and exterior finishing as well. Uh, glazing for the patio enclosures and the structures is almost complete and uh, installation of mechanical and electrical for the enclosed patios has started on the interior of the market uh, square as well as uh, fire rated separation work. Installation of concrete pavers continues uh, as weather permits along Harbour Passage and the wooden handrail installation continues as well. Currently the plan is to open the patios in June, um, weather permitting at this point in time, and uh, the plaza and the Harbour Passage trail in June as well. And then signage would follow that uh, hopefully in July. With respect to the private sector development at Fundiki, the developer continues to advance their development um, and as we've reported, pile driving is complete. Uh, I understand some concrete design modifications needed to happen given the final placement of the piles. And so now they're looking forward to getting underway with pouring of the concrete slab for the, uh, for the new build uh, that's at the southwest corner of the property. Uh, as it relates to the Central Peninsula School and the Community Hub, um, the province, Anglophone South District and the city are continuing to work on the new South End School located adjacent to Rainbow Park and the new North End School located at Rope Walk Road adjacent to the YMCA. Uh, there are several subcommittees that continue to work through various matters such as parking and public access, shared use, traffic, and uh, engineering and construction related questions and progress is being made on those. Uh, as reported last month, we're pleased that the government of New Brunswick has allocated funding for the new North End School and the Central Peninsula School so that the two community hubs will be part of it. And uh, last we heard, both schools are still officially slated to open in September 2026. Uh, as it relates to our new comprehensive uh, recreation facility, staff in recent months have worked with the Fundy Region Service Commission on the regional er arena needs assessment, a requirement for provincial support uh, for the new replacement arena. Uh, and the assessment has been finalized, shared with the province, and that's really an important step for us to be able to access provincial funding uh, work on assessing the various means to bring best value to taxpayers uh, has been finalized and now work is underway to confirm some of the project elements. Uh, that is all the work that is uh, necessary really, uh, all this work that's underway to ready us for a funding opportunity and so what we're really going to need next is the federal funding opportunity to uh, enable this project and so we're hopeful that uh, there'll be an opportunity arise through the federal government that will allow us to make application. 
Um, and then just moving on to the uh, advocacy affordable housing, city team continues to advance council's priority of affordable housing, the rapid housing initiative known as the Bear Green Residences uh, project by Kaleidoscope Social Impact um, uh, that will bring 39 affordable units to Broad Street. The developer has experienced a delay. He continues to work towards meeting various project requirements and we have engaged with the developer and CMHC to try and facilitate moving that project forward and the developers in the process of securing a general contractor with a tentative start date of April 2024. And lastly, as it relates to the Housing Accelerator Fund, the funding uh, will be dispersed over a four-year period to implement the plan, and the funding requires a city permit um, the 1,124 units over the next three years, of which 9% at minimum are to be affordable. And that, Your Worship, concludes my update, subject to any questions. Thank okay. you. Thank you. We have two. Councilor Agnew. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, I think it's going to be fabulous when we get Exhibition Park and the Y and the Double Rink. It'll be a great place for tournaments. Like you could see, you know, um, people in East St. John and uh, KV probably flocking there for um, buying ice time from us and that type of thing. And I really, in the last two weeks, I've met with a number of people in ball hockey lacrosse, hockey, top corner hockey, and they're dying. They're dying for time. We could get kids far more active in this city. Closing those two rinks discouraged uh, a lot of um, uh, participation in this city. It really hurt this city closing those two rinks. And I'm glad that we've dropped the word no and we're replacing it with grow. And we need to, when you see the communities in Fredericton and Moncton and Dieppe, how much they have now have an increase in participation by just building new facilities. The other thing that we have to do is encourage more, and St. John used to do that in the days of Nick Nicole and that, but I, I'm glad that we've raised recreation to where it should be. I think it should be raised even higher because it just, it just brings more people to the city, makes us much healthier. Um, but I would encourage you to get those two rinks open as fast as possible because closing those other two rinks really hurt the city. And I was chair of recreation when Simons was closed and the city made a promise to open that rink. And uh, so I really, really encourage you to get those two ice surfaces open as fast as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Harris. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, through you to the CAO. Um, Brent, can you, have we done any sort of, or I guess do we have in the list of to-dos, um, reaching out to our minor hockey associations to discuss the arena project? Um, <clears throat> yeah, we, we haven't yet, and, and it's a bit premature as we work through this final stage that we're on right now. Um, I think, you know, over the coming months, we'll be in a position where we'll be able to do that sort of thing. Uh, just a little premature right now. Yeah, I guess I, I got an email from a few of them kind of hearing about it. So um, I was just looking to follow up with them to figure out when that might be, but a couple months sounds good. Uh, and then the last part you were talking about with, you mentioned a number, I don't know if I've heard this number before, so refresh me if you, if you have mentioned it. You mentioned 1,158 units, I think, affordable housing units. This has created the Housing Accelerator Fund projections, is that correct? Or it's, it's, yeah, it's yeah, an obligation that we have to have. Just help me know. Correct, yeah. So the funding agreement requires the city permit 1,124 units over the next three years. So that's uh, essentially an obligation of ours within the agreement, of which a minimum of 9% of those need to be deemed affordable. How much? How much percentage? Nine, minimum of 9%. 90 or 9? Nine? 9 Nine zero. Okay, or so then we're looking at a commitment around 158 affordable units that we're on the hook for, or they're about 10 percent. Yeah, close to about 100 units. Okay, yeah. 100 units, and within that ballpark, and maybe this is a question for Commissioner Poff and Roth. <laughs> while we're here on the topic, how do we clarify and qualify? that a unit is going to be affordable because I know that there's provincial funding that's tied to that. There's different 
levels of requirement, you know, around the 30% of income point. There's a role for the province to play in all this, I know. So how do we plan to communicate that or at least be accountable to that where there is that provincial tie-in? Commissioner? Okay, so we need a minimum of 9% of our 1124 units need to be affordable. How we determine affordable, I may have to defer to An Andy Reid, but there is a there is a calculation um, as to um, the uh, the rent versus the the market rent. So I think it's yes, uh, I, you know, I know it's what a, you mean it's now. A calculation, yeah, we it's did. a percentage. Yes. So I just don't have it on the tip of my tongue. I'm sorry. That's okay. No, I do remember that part because I knew it wasn't tied to income; it was tied to a percentage of the market. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess yeah, the the difficult point there is, I guess what I'm looking to figure out is how do we enforce that, or how do we how do we grab that from the provincial numbers? Mm -hmm. And how does that interaction work? I don't know if that's all been worked out or not, Andy. I'm just kind of getting uh, some different insight on that now. Yeah, uh, through your worship to the councillor. So the reporting framework for half is that's an ongoing discussion with CMHC. We'll be a trend, attending a training session later this month on that reporting framework because we have to report results through this funding agreement. Um, as far as the definition of affordability for the HALF program, it's a good question because there are multiple definitions for affordable housing. Um, for the HALF program, for that purpose, CMHC leaves it up to the city to use our own local definition. Um, so the definition we would use would be the shelter to income ratio, which is uh, affordable housing is when uh, individuals are using no more than 30% of their pre-tax income. Um, it's a good question on how to monitor that um, we know there's about 101 units there of the 9%. So within the, the permits we're receiving for those units, I mean, we will be actively, our, our uh, approach currently, like I say, it's a working approach, but we'll be working closely with those developers, submitting their permits uh, to understand what funding they have in place. Oftentimes, the, uh, the, that definition is monitored according to the provincial program or federal program they're applying for. So we'll be working closely with, um, with those other levels of government, uh, sharing of information to ensure that we're meeting our targets and uh, hopefully exceeding them because 9% is, is lower than the target we set for ourselves under yeah. the affordable housing strategy. Deputy Mayor, I, know, I have one follow-up question. So well, I can you have kick to, it back to, to me. All right. Okay. Uh, Councilor Radwan, you're next. Thank you, Deputy. Um, so I, I have a couple of questions. So to the, first to CAO, um, through you, Deputy, I'm just wondering, with the pedestrian um, road that's going to be proposed for South Market Street, it looks like we're on target for completion in 2024. Is that right? Uh, yeah, that's, that's correct for the city portion. Okay. Uh, so we do have a, an agreement with a developer that would be a private sector component. Okay. But we would be developing the public sector component in 2024. Okay, that makes sense. And I'm just also wondering, kind of piggybacking a little bit on what Councillor Harris was talking about, and I don't need the number now, but I'm hoping maybe if we have it, it would be really good information, I think, for Council to have. I'm wondering if we keep track of how many units are going to open up for affordable housing. So just as an example, it comes top to my, of my mind, 1429 Lock Lomond, we approve the zoning. They have intention to apply for affordable housing. Of course, they have to do that through the province, but then we don't necessarily hear back as to whether or not they were approved. I'm just wondering if staff have the information on how many, you know, I'm looking at all these development sites that are coming to fruition in Milledgeville, you know, um, Anchorage, of course, uh, Charlie Bird's property there on, on uh, Daniel Avenue, have any of them gotten any f affordable units in there? And I don't mean subsidized units, I mean affordable okay. units. Yeah. So just wondering if we can maybe get that kind of number, if staff have it. Um, and if not, I'm almost wondering if that's something that we can try to pull from developers in the future. Okay. Do you want to... Uh, address that, Commissioner. Thank you. Through you, Deputy, to Councillor Redwan. It's not information that we track currently. Um, certainly, and with the information that uh, Mr. Reed provided, certainly for the housing accelerator, we're going to have to 
there's a few questions we have to answer and then how do we track, but you know, it, it is a question that we've had in the past and um, you know, I think it is some data that we are going to have to explore how we, how we uh, get that data, even if it's not connected to housing accelerator. So we can, we can come back to you on that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Councillor Ogden. Um, this morning, Amy and, uh, and Andrew, uh, I'm not sure if you heard it. I, it's the first time I heard it is that the federal government announced more money for directly flowing to municipalities, not the provinces, which is good news for us. And it's for housing, um, but the municipalities will have to lift restrictions on parking, I believe density. I didn't hear it all, but there was a fair amount of money there in addition to the recent m announcement that we had. Um, do you know anything about that or? Okay. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, through you, Deputy, to Councillor Ogden. Um, we are getting information about this uh, this new fund. Some of it is topping up the housing accelerator program uh, so that more municipalities can um, partake in the program. We have reached out to our contacts at CMHC to get more information around that. We understand that there's also a $6 billion fund around uh, infrastructure to support housing. So this is information we are um, getting today. I just got note of it um, uh, in the last couple of hours. So certainly we will be pursuing these and see how we can take advantage if, if we can. Thank you. Commissioner. Our restrictions, right? Thank you, Deputy. Um, so we are already through our housing accelerator program intending to make significant changes to the zoning bylaw, which will uh, enable um, greater density and reducing red tape so that uh, developers and property owners will be able to um, build more dense uh, buildings on lots without going through planning approval. So those are initiatives that's in our program already and we will be actioning this year. Okay, Councillor Harris, you can wrap us up. Thank you. Sorry for the round two, Deputy. I didn't get to it last time. And this is for Andy. I, don't, I assume it's it's for Andy. Um, it's it's probably uh, it's preliminary, potentially over to you, Commissioner, as well. I'm not sure, but I know that a while back at a growth committee meeting, we had talked about a landlord registry. Um, it would have been a while ago, so I'm not sure if anybody remembers it. But I know that the federal government just announced some pretty in their in their renter's bill of rights announcement, which is going to be substantial. Um, it puts aside a some language around a landlord registry um, to try to help with some of that tracking and um, I guess accountability around this affordability thing. Is there any sense from the provincial, from provincial counterparts that the province is in a position to explore this or have they explored this? Because I know it would be monumental for a city our size to try to have a landlord registry be possible. So it would have to be a provincial sort of interaction. Do we know of any connection point here to that or, yeah? Through, through your deputy, I'm, I'm not, uh, honestly, I'm not sure. There has been some discussion around um, units for rent. Um, so Airbnbs, there has been some discussion with our pro provincial partners, but um, I don't know. Andy, I don't know if you have something to add there around landlord yeah. registry. Uh, through the deputy mayor, through our uh, affordable housing action plan, it wasn't something that necessarily came up, uh, although we were aware city of Halifax introduced something similar, but it was more in relation to uh, property standards. So they actually, I believe, uh, received feedback from the City of St. John's Minimum Standards Program as they were developing their much larger program with, you know, there are, there's certainly uh, a whole bunch of implications on that. Um, but that's sort of the closest I can kind of connect those dots to. Okay, no, yeah. just curious, thanks so much. Okay, thank you, Andy. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, no further questions. Next item, Common Clerk. Uh, next item is 12.2 on your agenda, and it's the 2024 work plan update. And it's over to you, CAO. Thank you. I'll uh, take a second to pull up the 
presentation here. Okay, good evening. Um, as your CAO, I'm here this evening to present the 2024 Initiatives Plan. Council is aware, but for public's information, uh, the Initiatives Plan is derived primarily from the uh, Council priorities in the 10-year Strategic Plan. However, there are a number of other items that I'll touch on later that contributed to this plan, including the fact that we were recently before Finance Committee and included some of the items from the uh, Ernst & Young report to consolidate into uh, one means of tracking. So some items are also operational in nature, and if they are, they wouldn't be necessarily covered in here. This is intended to be more strategic. So um, just moving to the next slide. So members of council, you're all familiar with this, but for the benefit of the public working on the business, uh, again, this is our frontline um, service delivery and routine recurring work associated with service delivery. Uh, that residents expect day to day and, and week to week. Most of the demand is on city resources and that consumes the majority of um, time and resources as well as the majority of the budget. But working on the business when we're creating, renewing or implementing plans, strategies, policy programs uh, and conducting audits, reviews, uh, studies that are focused on major system changes and uh, infrastructure changes as well. So the foundation of the strategic initiatives plan includes continuing to work on some 2023 initiatives, keep in mind the uh, disruptions of last fall. Uh, the ma majority of initiatives are working on the business and uh, alignment with, again, the 10-year strategic plan, council's priorities, budget commitments, and in the EUI items. So when it comes to capacity, it's been a situation for some time that uh, we all tend to want to do more than we have the resources to undertake and too many initiatives to complete in, in any one year. So we did take some time with the uh, executive leadership team to really look at this and ensure that we're prioritizing and focusing resources um, so that we're able to focus on key priorities. Some of uh, what we had to consider is the complexity of initiatives. In many cases, there are external partners uh, that are integral in terms of delivering results. And so projects are much more straightforward if they're completely within the municipal realm and we're able to control, but a lot of the times so that's not our reality. And so we have other layers of government as well that we're uh, dependent upon to advance projects. So. For the external support, uh, it's busy times in the city for consulting services and contractors and uh, supply chain impacts uh, as well as inflationary pressures continue. Um, new responsibilities for, for significant involvement of municipalities and key files that we haven't been involved with in the past and that does uh, you know, put a strain on, on our resources that we haven't had in the past. Then when new work arises uh, or the work plan has to get adjusted as a result of the new work, new work that comes on. So that all adds to um, the capacity. And I'll provide an overview in terms of the criteria and considerations given. So first off alignment, does it align with our strategic objectives? Um, you know, like tax base growth or population growth, those sorts of things. We also looked at risk to the organization, to the corporation, you know, either from a major system failure or safety issue or funding opportunity, or is there an external obligation on us to actually deliver on this? And then resources, the ability to progress initiatives with the people that we have, uh, the skills and the ability to actually get the work completed. And then there's performance, you know, how it contributes overall to the effectiveness and uh, efficiency of, of our service delivery, and lastly, uh, service area capacity. In terms of looking at priorities, um, I've talked about how the plan was derived and the inputs to it. The uh, strategic initiatives plan 
is focused, it's strategic, it's budgeted, it's coordinated with stakeholders, and initiatives in most cases have long-term positive impacts for the City of St. John. And the projects are grouped into three main areas, so transformational and catalytic growth initiatives, service area initiatives, and capital plan initiatives. For the transformational and catalytic growth initiatives, those are the highest priority ones. Uh, service initiatives that can either be one year or possibly multi-year depending upon the magnitude of the project. Service area initiatives are really focused in the service area, so in the department, and those projects can be impacted if there's demand by the transformational projects because those will be the ones that will be impacted so that we remain focused on the transformational and catalytic growth initiatives. And then there's the capital plan initiatives that are part of our capital plan. In terms of the priorities, there's the uh, there's 15 of the uh, transformational and catalytic growth, and then 20 of the service area, and six of the capital plan. So, first, I'll uh, focus on the transformational and catalytic priorities projects that are cross-functional. First, we plan to advance the delivery of the affordable housing action plan that we discussed earlier through the housing accelerator fund. There are eight key initiatives within that plan that are listed on the slide that range from the North End Neighborhood Plan to new affordable housing initiatives to leveraging land, whether that be municipal, provincial, or federal, um, and uh, reforming our zoning bylaw and governance reform. This is clearly a large undertaking, and uh, it's a multi-year project. So we're developing recommendations on the city's response to homelessness using a policy approach, and partnership with other levels of government and a deliverable for this year is a creation of the housing for all policy with the movement to implementation on the policy. Work with the province and other stakeholders in the development of the Central Peninsula Commons and the North End School. Um, and uh, we're providing support on a number of levels as I touched on just uh, earlier. Uh, support of the Rapid Housing Initiative, also requiring support, ongoing support of city staff. And this slide captures a number of the catalytic growth priorities. So I'll continue to focus on the development of the new comprehensive recreation facility and for our industrial parks. We're establishing an arm, arm's length corporation for the management of the industrial parks the redevelopment of Fundy Key continues uh, with the planned handover of the site for development in 2024. And we're strategically advancing our advocacy files that include comprehensive tax reform, bilateral funding, affordable housing, and the creation of post-secondary ed education. <clears throat> we're going to be undertaking a parking study that supports the development of priorities within the Central Peninsula, a key intensification area of the city. We'll continue to work with the massive undertaking of replacing our ERP system, which is one that is an example of a, a risk in our organization. Uh, that project will really touch just about every employee in the organization. And, the, and then establish a structure that will facilitate the city receiving revenue from St. John Energy's growth plan, uh, one that was advertised publicly recently and is a good example of a project that's interlinked and dependent upon another level of government. Modernize the city's safety program. This is a significant undertaking that we will be uh, really be transformational. And we have a number of deliverables in 2024 on safety and this flowed out of the safety audit that we uh, conducted by our internal audit team. Develop a comprehensive 10-year human resources strategy inclusive of succession planning, employee recognition, employee performance, and this is underway at this time. The next one is performance management uh, where we'll develop additional strategic operational level metrics, enhanced dashboards, and corporate standard practices. And this is one that is really requires a complete cultural shift and is a multi-year project to really do it right and ensure that we change the culture permanently to a more uh, performance-based mindset. And um, 
implementing an asset management information system uh, that's underway and will run uh, through 2024 and into 2025. The next grouping is the service area initiatives that I mentioned, and so evaluate and implementation plan for community support for East St. John. This is one that came out of council as part of the budget process. Uh, so that's on the plan. Uh, complete the implementation of the five enhanced recreational program services. Um, a lot of these are done, but the rollout of the trikes is scheduled for June of this year. And uh, develop actions for a social plan, implement diversity and inclusion policy for the city workforce, and to continue to work through actions relating to the Central Peninsula Secondary Plan. A number of those are underway, but we're really consolidating that plan and identifying what is next on it to ensure that we complete all of it. Um, implement some of the uh, approved actions of the City Market Strategic Plan with the number of deliverables in 2024, and this will require a dedicated resource that we'll be bringing forward in the near future. Implement inclusion and anti-racism initiatives, uh, which are underway and targeted and completed to be completed in 2024 to attract and retain newcomers in the community. Another transformational project, but based at the service level is a consolidation of operations into the transit and Rossi Avenue uh, facilities work is well underway with a targeted fleet move to the transit facility to be completed mid this year, followed by Public Works, uh, the <coughs> Boar's Head Road facility in Milledgeville, moving to Rossi Avenue operation, and then establish an advisory committee for the implementation of climate change plans like ACT SJ and the Community Energy Action Plan. And um, we implemented the annual, initial annual symposium with the development industry, and the first one was held last month, and we'll be briefing council on that. Um, investing in the community enhancement, we now have additional bylaw enforcement officers, uh, and so they're hired, and the pilot program is now underway. As part of our transforming transit plan, while the electronic fares are operational, uh, implementation of the electronic system uh, continues and we also uh, will enhance communication and service for transit riders with AVL and CAD on the transit system, providing automatic bus location service. Uh, so that is something that's in the works as well as part of the 15 year strategic plan for fire. We'll establish a framework that'll finalize the plan and create the action plan uh, moving forward. And then with respect to NextGen 911, that's a provincially led project that we're you know, obligated to be a part of and it requires a fair amount of involvement from the city in implementing technology and processes to meet legislated requirements. Uh, and this project is forecasted to be completed in the next 12 months. And we will complete the 10 year long-term financial plan for the water utility, which has been in development and be wrapped up this year our enterprise risk management project is well underway and scheduled to be completed this year for the Trade and Convention Center. As it relates to the management services contract, we issued an RFP, which closed recently. Evaluations are underway. and We'll be looking uh, to award contract services in the not too distant future. Uh, we will be undertaking an internal audit of our Market Square contract. That's one of our larger contracts. That'll be a significant undertaking in 2024, and that'll go into 2025. And as it relates to negotiations, uh, we're underway right now with fire uh, service for a collective agreement. And as uh, Council knows, we uh, completed negotiations on the transit collective agreement. Now moving to the capital plan initiative. So the team is developing a 10 year capital plan. That's a really large undertaking um, and uh, work is underway and the initial cut will, of that plan will be completed this year and then we'll refine it and continue to refine it as we move forward. Redevelopment of the market slip public space known as Idoli Makahamek, uh, as I reported on earlier, continues to advance uh, we will be 
pedestrianizing one street, as uh, Councilor Radwan had asked earlier, South Market Street. So that's intended to be completed this summer uh, for the city component of that, uh, that street. And then the Main Street Active Transportation Corridor, uh, that requires provincial approval. And we're looking forward to getting provincial approval so that we can get our approvals in place and, and uh, advance that project. And uh, we're undertaking the implement, implementation of 20 major, major traffic calming projects in accordance with the policy. So some streets are being narrowed this year. Uh, some are moving to complete streets. And uh, we're also adding uh, the speed cushions on a couple of streets. And for security at city facilities, the focus this year is primarily on City Hall uh, being customer service area as well as the council chambers. And then uh, some projects are being delayed for specific reasons or being integrated with other projects. So for example, uh, creation of a cricket field uses you know, currently underway with exhibition grounds. Uh, so we really need to solidify a site for that. And really that's the next step. And uh, once we have the land, then we can focus on advancing this project. So really lands the, the component of that one, but we continue to work with uh, the Cricket Association St. John to advance, uh, you know, and support them on, uh, on that. Uh, another example is long-term strategic plan for transit. And so this is one that's important, but we really need the data first in order to deliver on that. And so the data uh, systems will all be set up this year, and that will provide a rich amount of data to us that will help inform a long-term plan and make recommendations that are informed by data. Uh, our planned internal audit at Market Square, um, or sorry, uh, the redesign of our continuous improvement program will be uh, integrated with performance management. So really that's undertaking a more holistic approach. And a uh, couple of the projects are completed, therefore can be removed, like phase two community center needs assessment. Um, that was done earlier this year. Uh, and, and move through council. Uh, the other one that is completed is the establishment of the grant program, and uh, we'll continue to do communications on that one. The next three are more operational in nature, like the implementation of this uh, civic commemoration policy. The policy has been created, civic commemoration committee stood up, and this is really operationalizing that. So for the most part, that is completed and it's really ongoing operations now. Partnering with Port St. John on waterfront revitalization initiatives and uh, delivery of the uh, city's succeed and stay strategy um, are being tracked operationally, uh, but work continues on, on, um, on that item. Um, and then moving along to a few initiatives that have been more appropriately moved to the RSC uh, or to Envision, like the identification of gaps uh, in terms of dealing with legislation on train noise that was really a regional issue. Uh, and so the, FRS, or the FRSC is taking that on and that's part of their work plan this year and then implementing um, a regional immigration strategy uh, Envision is looking at, and of course, we're still advancing our own immigration strategy, that is the city one. And last uh, relates to developing city sourced revenue. Uh, and that's really uh, been dealt with. Uh, this one was one that came about, I think, through sustainability. Uh, and that's really been dealt with through other means, through financial policies, uh, and so that one is, uh, is set to be removed as well. And so with that, uh, the recommendation is to receive and file the 2024 initiatives plan. And that concludes my presentation. Subject to any questions, Your Worship. Okay, thank you, uh, CAO. I'm just wondering what, <coughs> what's staff doing? <laughs> <laughs> like that is, a, you've got that packed in there, I'll tell you, that's quite a, quite a, uh, a lot of work. Okay, we've got a couple of comments or questions. One from Councillor Ogden. 
Brent, when you mentioned City Hall, I didn't quite hear everything you said. Did you say that you're going to sort of recreate or brighten, spruce up the plaza area outside City Hall? Was that there? That isn't there. Um, we, uh, you know, when I referenced City Hall, I think it was more to do with the security, so focused security projects. Okay. There's a number of them underway, but focused security projects are really for our customer service staff. It's rather as well dreary. As, as well as... Uh, it's rather dreary that in the, in the plaza and going into the city market. and Maybe there's cosmetic stuff we can do, but it, I don't know. When you go and raise the flag, it's just doesn't do much for you. Uh, when they raised the Indian flag, they all brought food and I, then we had to find a picnic table and it was, I just think it could be brightened up. Actually, there are, you're jogging my memory. We did have a discussion here just over the past month and it might have been with Commissioner Poff and Roth. And so there is something that I've asked the team to look at as it relates to that, particularly for gathering areas because we talked about maybe the ability to place food or something of that or a public art piece so we are looking at it no commitments yet and okay. nothing budgeted yet but we are looking at ideas uh that and uh the team is going to be coming back with some of those the other thing i wanted to say this continuous improvement uh, the japanese started something in the 50s and 60s imagine it goes farther back in their culture social economic called a mai and every day everybody gets up with the idea that how can i make things better whether it's at your job or whether it's in society. And if you look at the Japanese culture, like if you take a RAV4 or something, every year they continuously improve that vehicle. And that's with the mindset is not just with staff, but is, and so that means the workers have to be listened to and they're encouraged to be listened to with every day, what can we do better? You know, and talking to the people on the street at the, at, at the grassroots level that are, you know, with the hands on. So that, that culture of Amai is really important, that progressive, everyday uh, feeling that everybody's important and their contribution's important. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Harris? Yeah, just two questions. I don't remember hearing anything about community center needs assessment. You say that was completed. Jog my memory on this, because you know, my timeline on this is, I, I remember we did a neighborhood uh, like community center, neighborhood organizational symposium about a year and a half ago, 18 months ago or so. Um, and I know that we revisited some of the long-term funding pieces. But when we say that there has been, the, the needs assessment's been finished, um, does that mean we've closed the door here on, on reframing or improving some of those existing agreements? I think specifically around the, the conversation that we haven't had at council. So maybe you can cut me off at the pass from getting too wound up in details. I guess the overall thing is, is we haven't really sat down and said, with population growth, what level of service do our community centers now need to achieve that is new, is net new in the community? How, and how are we empowering them to do that? Because it not just doesn't just create you know, needs on classic services, new services need to be invented with that population growth and with the piece. So I guess I'm worried that that's communicating that we're done something. Maybe that's not what it's communicating. So just yeah, help me with that. It's a good question. And maybe I'll have uh, our commissioner, uh, Ms. Popner, I'll just expand on it for you. Yeah, th uh, through uh, the to the counselor. Um, so my understanding, of the phase two was around a couple of particular community um, agreements that we had, particularly the Waterloo Village group, the Milledgeville Community Center uh, run by the Y and the Around the Block. So those were three um, agreements that uh, we had given them additional time um, to work on some service enhancements and increased accountability with respect to the service that they provide. So that wrapped up. And um, what we'll be working on this year is around the East Side Community Center needs to determine what's what do we have what what is the need and what are the gaps so that we can make a recommendation to go forward to p potentially enhance the service on the east side so that was that was a program that was completed but you know there's there's still more to do and okay. uh, next step will be east side yeah and i'll throw another one at you <laughs> the same probably the same uh, uh route here to amy um 
Commissioner, can you tell me about the, are we going to be having a more fulsome conversation with the developer symposium? Is that already something we're going to do? Because I, okay. Yes. So if that's, then I'll leave it for them. Thanks. Yes. Okay, Councillor Radwan. Thank you, Deputy. Through to uh, CAO, uh, uh, things look really good. There's lots, uh, definitely lots in the docket. I was wondering, I think that this was something I'd have to look back that was going to go into maybe 2025, but the labor relations <laughs> strategy. And I'm wondering where we are with um, standing up a housing entity. Um, and I just in what Commissioner Poppenroth was talking about, I think it'd be really great to connect with the uh, the food bank on the east side. They give out a lot of clothes, and the church is quite involved there. So just a little thought that I had come to my mind. I, I don't know why I can't think of the name, but anyway, I can get it for you later. But um, yeah, so wondering about the labor relations strategy and the housing entity, where we are with that. Yeah, through your worship, uh, the housing entity would fall under governance reform as uh, as part of the uh, the housing action plan, the housing accelerator fund. So in the list here, there's eight projects and it falls mm -hmm. under number eight, which is the governance reform component. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's where that one's listed. As it relates to the labor relations strategy, uh, maybe I'll ask uh, Ms. Hasek to just uh, comment as it ties in with our HR uh, initiative that we have underway. Sure. Good evening. Through you, Deputy, to the Councillor. Uh, there was a great deal of work done on the labour strategy a couple of years ago, and um, we have we continue to work that plan and that strategy, and we will also be picking that back up again after we finalize the 10-year HR strategy that we're currently working on right now that is um, projected to be done at the end of the year. So we're picking up that strategy again as well. But yes, we did uh, quite a bit of work on that a couple of years ago. I, I know it takes a lot of time. Um, I think as we're getting into contract negotiations, it becomes more and more uh, important to have that ready. Um, and with the housing entity, just to kind of go back to that for a moment, I can't recall, is it something that we figured that we'd be able to do this year or by the end of 25? I was just trying to figure out the timeline. I can't remember. I know I was talking about it when we were approving everything for where the pockets of money would go for the housing accelerator, but um, just trying to get an idea. As you know, as I drive in um, most days, seeing more and more people unhoused, it feels more and more urgent um, to do these things. So, um, yeah, I don't have the plan at my fingertips in terms of the schedule, but I know Andy Reid would likely know it right off. Come on up. Andy O'Clopping can okay, speak to you. it in the mic. Sorry about <laughs> that. Through the deputy and the uh So indeed, the housing, uh, the governance reform initiative um, was dovetailed into the housing accelerator fund action plan. Um, the current uh, timeline on that uh, this year, we're working on uh, on an RFP to release to explore various models. We can understand the full uh, landscape, kind of what's changed, who the current actors are, um, to then be able to come back with to council with a full report mm -hmm. and recommendation on different options um, and the financial implications of those options mm -hmm. and other implications of those options for a municipal housing entity. Um, so that uh, that should come back in 2025, and then the next steps would follow that report and recommendation to council. Do you have an RFP ready to go? We have an RFP drafted. Okay. Um, so we're we're fine tuning that amongst the other priorities mm. um, with the uh, accelerated fund action plan. I mean, I think the sooner that we can get something like that out, Andy, the better. Um, you know, it's April now. It's really, really important. Even if, even if you got, you know, some ideas back and you had to kind of mull over it for a little bit, like you definitely need to give yourself a little bit of time to look at those, I think. So sooner the better. I know you don't want to rush through, but um, it's like it's such a housing crisis that we're dealing with now. It's, uh, it's even more important than ever. Appreciate the feedback. Thank you. Okay. 
All right, I don't see any more questions. Uh, like I said, you've got a packed item here, but uh, thanks very much. It lets everybody know just exactly what's happening in the city, and there's a lot going on. You know, Thank St. You. John's really moving forward, so thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Worship. And clearly, uh, as you can see tonight, with a number of other people involved, it takes a team so to get this done, and um, you know, everyone's committed to doing that and advancing this initiative plan in 2024, so thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Um, next item, Tom Clark. Oh, we need, uh, we need a motion receive and for file receiving. motion. File, yes. uh, Councilor Sullivan and Councilor Stewart on the question. All in favor? Uh, that's passed. Thank you very much. Okay, next item, Common Clerk. Uh, thank you. Next on the agenda is under general correspondence. Uh, item 15-1 is a letter from Jay Tracy with respect to 1671 Sandy Point Road. There is a staff recommendation to receive this letter for information. Okay, can I get a mover for the recommendation? Councillor Hickey, seconder. Councillor Sullivan, on the question. All those in favor? Thank you very much. Next item. Next is 15-2, a letter from Prude Inc. with respect to all women project recommendations. And this has a recommendation to refer to the CAO for a follow-up discussion with Prude Inc. Yep. Can I get a mover for the recommendation? Councillor Radwan, seconder. I get a seconder, uh, Councillor Sullivan. On the question, all in favor? Who's got a white Who's got, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Councillor Rodwan. Thank you, Deputy. I just wanted to first uh, send a thank you over to Prude and Brenda Diaz in particular. Mayor Reardon actually asked me to sit on this committee and everybody who participated, including our own Jennifer Walshutes, were incredible. Um, there is a lot of recommendations and here's some really, really good information. They collected a lot of data um, and it's a lot. It's certainly a lot. And I reviewed it with Brenda at the end and she did a lot of work. One recommendation, uh, CAO, that I would just make um, would be to send a copy over to transit police and to the province just for them to have it if they want to use any of the recommendations because some of them are directed to them. Some of them it's not in our hands to do. So I, you know, I recognize that as, as one of the community members. I don't know if Brenda did that. She's no longer at Prude. So, um, but anyway, but thank you very much for taking a look at this and I'm happy to ask, answer any questions if you have any too. Thank you. Yeah. And through your worship, um, yeah, we we really, you know, when we read through this, there's a lot of questions, a lot of good uh, information, and we really want to do it justice, uh, you know, given that we received it late last week, so shared it with some of the team, including transit. Uh, they have it, and they've already, you know, put together a lot of responses, but I think it'd be good to sit down and have the discussion and really open the dialogue and, and uh, share some information and get some feedback. Great. Thank you very much. Okay, next item, Common Clerk. Uh, next are the items that came from Committee of the Whole. So the first one of those would be 17.1, and this is with respect to sale of city land on Douglas Avenue to the province of New Brunswick. And the council resolution for this would be that the city enter into a, an agreement of purchase and sale, generally in the form as presented to Committee of the Whole at its meeting of April 2nd, 2024, with His Majesty the King and Right of the province of New Brunswick, for the sale of lands identified as PID 5522012, and that the mayor and city clerk be authorized to execute the said agreement of purchase and sale and any other documents necessary to effect the transfer. Okay, I got a mover. Councillor Sullivan, seconder, Councillor Norton on the question. All in favor signify by saying aye. Opposed, if any. Motion's carried. Next item, Common Clerk. So next is item 17.2, and this is with respect to city market lease with chicken by Felix. And the resolution is now therefore be it resolved that the city enter into a lease generally in the form as presented to committee of the whole at its meeting held March 18, 2024 for stall D and ancillary spaces to the city market with UFAN investment, DBA chicken by Felix, and further be it resolved that the mayor and city clerk be authorized to execute any necessary documents. I get a mover for the re resolution. Councillor Sullivan, Councillor Stewart on the question. All in favor? Against? Motion carried. Next item, Common Clerk. Uh, next is 17.3, and this is for incorporation of St. John Industrial Parks. 
and the resolution for this item would be that this that the city as the sole shareholder of St. John Industrial Parks Limited change the name of that corporation to 014621NB Limited and that the mayor and clerk be authorized to execute the shareholders resolution generally in the form as presented to committee of the whole at its meeting held on April 2nd, 2024 to effect this change. Number two, that Melanie Tompkins as the sole director of the St. John Industrial Parks Limited be authorized to sign the form three as presented to committee of the whole at its meeting held on April 2nd, 2024. Three, that the Chief Administrative Officer, Chief Financial Officer, and General Counsel be authorized to sign and file the application, generally in the form as presented to Committee of the Whole at its meeting held on April 2nd, 2024, with Director of Compliance, uh, Director of Companies Act in order to incorporate a nonprofit corporation under the Companies Act with the name St. John Industrial Parks 2024 Limited. Number four, that the Chief Administrative Officer, Chief Financial Officer, and General Counsel be appointed provisional directors of St. John Industrial Parks 2024 Limited, once incorporated, and number five, that the provisional directors of St. John Industrial Parks 2024 Limited be directed to adopt the bylaw generally in the form as presented to Committee of the Whole at its meeting held on April 2nd, 2024, for the purpose of making the City of St. John the sole permanent member of St. John Industrial Parks 2024 Limited, and six, that the CAO be directed to call for applications for directors of the newly created St. John Industrial Parks 2024 Limited and advance those recommendations through the nominating committee for approval. Okay, Councillor Lowe, you're going to move those six recommendations, and Councillor Norton seconded. On the question, all in favor? Opposed, if any, motions carried. Next item, Common Clerk. And the final item from Committee of the Whole is with respect to release of easement and restrictive covenants against PID 55008932. The resolution is that the City release the easement and restrictive covenant recorded on Certificate of Registered Ownership for PID 55008932 and that the Mayor and Clerk be authorized to execute the discharge of restrictive covenant generally in the form as presented to Committee of the Whole held at its meeting held on April 2nd, 2024 and any other documents necessary to effect the release. Okay, can I get a resolution? Councillor Sullivan, seconder Councillor Hickey on the question. All in favor? Opposed, if any? Motion is carried. Okay, over to you, Councillor Law. <laughs> Got a motion to adjourn. All in favor? Opposed, if any? Good night, everybody, and thank you very much. Remember, we have to recall.